From Slave Ship to Freedom Road by Julius Lester, illustrated by Rod Brown. They took the sick and the dead and dropped them into the sea like empty wine barrels. But wine barrels did not have beating hearts, crying eyes, and screaming mouths. I think often of those ancestors of mine whose names I do not know, whose names I will never know, those ancestors who saw people thrown into the sea like promises casually made and easily broken. It was primarily the youngest and the strongest who survived the Middle Passage, that three-month-long ocean voyage from the western shores of Africa to the so-called New World. My ancestors might have been young when the slave ship left, but when it docked, they were haunted by memories of kinsmen tossed into the sea like promises never meant to be kept and of gulls crying like mourners. They could still hear the wind wailing at the sight of the black bodies bobbing in the blue water like bottles carrying notes nobody would ever read. So many Africans were thrown into the sea. Sharks swam alongside slave ships waiting for the inevitable bodies. For approximately 1518 until 1865, ships from Great Britain, Holland, Portugal, France, and the United States brought Africans to the New World to work for no money. Millions were taken. No one knows how many millions died except the sharks. Side by side they lay, coffin straight, coffin narrow, coffin black. Side by side they lay, alive, alive, oh so alive. It is difficult to imagine times and places long past. We must try if we are to redeem those times in ourselves. The means by which we can do this is in the imagination, which gives flesh and blood and soul to the past and present. Each of those millions of Africans was, is a story, just as you and I are stories. Voice 1. The darkness was blacker than any night. Where was my father, my mother? Did they know where I was? Why didn't they come and get me? Did they ever know what happened to me? Voice 2. Our bodies did, not, did what they had to do where we lay. Urine and excrement fell on me from above and mine onto those below. The smell was as thick as hatred. Voice 3. I was shackled by my wrist and ankles to a man on my right and one on my left. I could not stand. I could not turn over. I will never understand what I did to deserve this. This is what I imagine three Africans might have said. What would it be like not to know where you were going or what was going to happen to you when you got there? You're, you have memories of those Africans too, even if, even if you're white, especially if you're white. When I was young, I liked to listen to old people talk about what things had been like when they were young. They would get a faraway look in their eyes, and I knew they were seeing that faraway time called the past. I wanted their eyes to be mine, so I could see what had been, so I could know what they knew. Tibby looks as if he is more there than here. What do you think he is seeing? Or who? If you could ask him a question, what would it be? I'd like to know how he got those holes in his hat, and why doesn't he get a new one? Go ahead, close your eyes, ask him a question, then wait. If you are patient and listen closely, he will answer you. My real name is Timothy, and so was my son's. Folks called him Little Timmy. He couldn't say that. Most he could manage was Tibby, and that's what they started calling me. Massa sold Little Tibby when he was five years old. Just come and took him one day. That was fifty years ago. When you see me looking way off into the ever... I be hearing him calling to me as Massa took him away. Big Tibby, Big Tibby. That was the last time I saw him. Running away was common. People ran because they had been mistreated or they were afraid they were going to be sold or they just wanted to be free. Posters offering rewards for the capture of runaways were as much a part of the southern landscape as mosquito bites in the spring. In North Carolina, slaves ran away to the mountains and were taken in by the Cherokee Indians. Slaves from Georgia and Alabama disappeared into Florida, which until 1819 belonged to Spain and thus was outside the laws of the United States. The runaways joined with some Seminole Indians and made forays back into Georgia and Alabama to free more slaves. In Virginia, slaves ran away and disappeared into forbidding and almost impenetrable area called the Great Dismal Swamp. 
They lived there for decades, creating small villages of runaway slaves. Many slaves escaped to free states in the north, while others went farther north into Canada. But for all those who ran away, most were caught and brought back to the white patrols, or patrollers as the slaves called them. They stumbled and fell as they were pulled and dragged by a rope tied to a horse's saddle horn. They were brought back to be made examples of so the other slaves could see what would happen to them if they tried to escape. For some, dying in the effort to be free was better than being a slave. Samuel got caught. It didn't mean Samuel wouldn't try again and again and again. To have value in the heart of another, to value another in your heart, is that not what it means to be human? If I value you in my heart, I would rather hurt myself than hurt you, if I value you in my heart. Slavery was part of a business. The slave owner wanted to make as much money as he could. But what happened if the price of cotton fell one year and the slave owner could not pay his bills? He would have to raise cash and cut expenses. A slave was an expense like mules, horses, plows, and cotton seed. John, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to sell Delilah. Oh, Massa, you can't do that. She's the only child we got left. I don't have any choice. She's young and she'll bring a good price on the market. You understand how it is. Things have been bad this year. What with the drought and the market being flooded with Egyptian cotton. If I don't sell off some of the slaves, I'll lose everything. You sell my daughter, Massa, I, and I lose everything. I'm sorry, John. I really am. Slavery was a business. Sometimes people had to be sold to keep the business going. That's how it is if you want to make a profit. Slaves trying to escape, there were no Rand McNally maps with routes marked this way to freedom. There were no interstate highways with rest stops, but there was moss growing on the north side of trees and the shadows of trees falling west or north, and at night the North Star, and there were always rivers to cross. How did they manage that? Who knows? Runaway slaves were careful not to tell the secrets of how they escaped, fearing they would deprive other slaves of using the same methods. How do you cross a river when you can't take the ferry or walk over a bridge? But crossing a river was minor compared to making the decision to escape. There are many more fears than there are rivers, and fears are harder to wade through. What if we get caught? What if somebody gets hurt or dies along the way? How will we eat? What if we make it to freedom? Then what? Where will we live? How will we make a living? The only way to cross over fear is to do what you are afraid of doing. Throughout slavery, there were white people who risked their lives to help runaway slaves. They believed the best way to affirm their humanity was to fight against slavery. Some even died. Most were ordinary people who made secret rooms in their homes where runaway slaves could hide as they made their way north along that network known as the Underground Railroad. So many whites and free blacks began to assist runaways that the federal government passed a law, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, making it illegal to help runaway slaves. This made many hate slavery even more. Why did these people, and whites in particular, risk their freedom and safety to help runaway slaves? Would you risk going to jail to help someone you didn't know? Would you risk losing your freedom to help someone not of your race? Many who took such risks did so because they believed it was the right thing to do. They had studied the Bible and sat in church Sunday after Sunday. To them, it was obvious. God was on the side of the poor and the oppressed. If they were going to do God's work, they had to help the poor and the oppressed. It was just that simple. The history books say Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. It is true that he signed a document called the Emancipation Proclamation, which established a legal precedent for freedom. But to give all the credit to Lincoln omits what the slaves and free blacks did for themselves and the nation. Ultimately, no one can free anyone else. You have to free yourself. Somebody else can unlock the door and even push it ajar, but they can't walk through it for you. You have to do that. That's how it was when the Civil War started in 1861, the war that would determine whether America was going to be one nation devoid of slavery or two nations, one for slave owners and slaves and the other for free people. Blacks, slave, and free knew it would not be good if only white men risked their lives on the battlefields. 
It would not be good if only white men lost arms, legs, and their lives, while black men stood on the sidelines, unmaimed, unhurt, alive. Slaves ran away from plantations and droves whenever the Union Army came near, begging to be used in the war after effort. In North, free blacks led by the ex-slave orator Frederick Douglass beseeched the government to let them join the army. Douglass became the first black man to ever meet with a U.S. president when he sat down with Lincoln and urged him to create an all-black regiment to fight in the war. Finally, Lincoln agreed. The war to end slavery could only accomplish its purpose if those most directly affected fought and died too, and they did. What was it like to dream about freedom, long for freedom, and never dare to hope that it would happen? Then one day, a day like all the day other days, you're working in the field. You see a Union soldier dressed in blue right up to the slave owner's house. A little later, he and the slave owner come to the field and tell you to stop working because the slave owner has something to tell you. You're free, he says. I don't own you no more. You can come and go as you please, just like a white man. What would you feel? Look at the slaves. Look at their faces. What do you see there? You would think they would be happy. Why do you look ap apprehensive and afraid? Freedom for slavery was not the same as freedom to do whatever they wanted. They were free, but where were they supposed to go? They owned no land. They had no houses of their own. What were they supposed to do with this freedom if they did not have money or a place to live? Free, they were free. I have no doubt that inside themselves, freed slaves were delirious with excitement. But on the outside, they did not know what freedom meant. Some slave owners kicked their former slaves off the land. Others allowed their ex-slaves to remain and work for money. The former slave owners still needed their labor, and the former slaves needed jobs. Many slaves stayed where they were. Others left, not knowing where they were going and not much caring. Still others went in search of wives and children and husbands who had been sold away. Freedom to the responsible for oneself and one's time, freedom to own oneself, freedom to be one's own master, freedom. It's like a promise we are still learning to how to keep.